Welcome to the program. Dr. Stephanie Canizellis joins us today. She's a researcher, author, and professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of California, Berkeley, where she's faculty director of the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative. She earned her Ph.D. in sociology from the University of Southern California in 2018. Stephanie specializes in the study of international migration and immigrant integration, with a particular interest in the experiences of Latin American origin immigrants and their descendants in the United States. Over the last decade, Stephanie has focused her work on the migration and the coming of age of unaccompanied children from Central America and Mexico in California and Texas. Throughout her research and writing, Stephanie explores the role of immigration policy in shaping the everyday lives of migrant children and their families, how immigrants in the communities they arrive to remake one another mutually, and immigrants' articulations of success and well-being within an increasingly unequal U.S. society. Stephanie's first book, Sin Padres Ni Papeles, takes on many of these issues. Born and raised in Los Angeles, California, Stephanie is the daughter of Salvadoran immigrants, whose experiences growing up as an unaccompanied youth in Los Angeles motivated her commitment to public scholarship. Stephanie's research has appeared in the New York Times, the Atlantic, Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times, among other outlets. She also uses her expertise to inform policy through her work as U.S. Department of Health and Human Services resident scholar and a UNICEF USA research consultant. The the topic we're going to explore today with Dr. Canizellis is unaccompanied minors, but but through the experiences of those that she has interviewed as part of her book and part of her research. And I also thought it was important that we we take the human angle of this topic. Uh, we know that there's important policy elements to discuss. We know that there are differing views of the best way to address humanitarian issues and economic issues. But this episode is not about policy prescriptions per se. This episode is not about staring at the problem and, you know, catastrophizing worst case scenarios. This episode is really about exploring the understandings of people who are going through a relocation in their life under duress with huge amounts of stress, all while they are children and teenagers. And I thought it was important for us, given what we do on this program, to step back from the headlines and step back from the the political rhetoric and all of that and just focus on the humanity of the people involved and the facts of the situation from the view of a sociologist. And so I'm really excited that we were able to to get Dr. Canizellis to come on this program. She's done some great work as part of her scholarship, and I think she articulates these issues and becomes a voice for so many of the voiceless Um, in American society, but I think a a lot of what you're going to hear in this program translates to more countries than just the U.S. with any number of people who are migrating around the world and facing similar challenges and similar experiences. So as I always ask you to do, I I ask you to come to this interview with open minds and open hearts. Uh, We're not here to make statements uh, in a definitive way that we have all the answers for everything. We're here to explore topics and expand our minds. And so uh, we had a great conversation with Dr. Canizellis, and I am proud to present that conversation to you now. Dr. Stephanie Canizellis, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Welcome to the program. So let's give our audience a little bit of your background and what brought you to this research on this important topic. Yeah, so uh, I am a sociologist. I am a daughter of Salvadoran immigrants. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I came to this project really interested in studying immigrant youth, Central American immigrant youth, and how young people form their identities as individuals, but also part, you know, members of a community. Um, as their coming of age. And I was really deeply embedded in the immigrant youth movement, the immigrant, uh, undocumented immigrant youth movement in Los Angeles around 2009. Um, and in my graduate program became very interested in just understanding how immigrant youth groups work, right? I was introduced to a series of, uh, youth-led organizations and was among one of them introduced to a group of unaccompanied, undocumented garment workers in Los Angeles. And this was in 2012. 
uh, at the time, again, I was really deeply embedded in youth organizing, in school spaces, in colleges. So I was really shocked to learn that there were undocumented young people outside of schools, in factories, car washes, restaurants first, but also that these young people, I was meeting them when they were 18, 19, 20 years old, um, but they had been in, in Los Angeles for five, eight, 12 years, um, and that they were growing up alone. And that wasn't anything that I had seen around me. It wasn't anything I'd read at a, as a sociologist or as a student sort of entering into any sort of intellectual project. So I took it on in 2012 as my um, research agenda, my point of inquiry. Uh, folks will remember that by 2014, the U.S. saw the humanitarian crisis at the border of unaccompanied child migration. Uh, so I was in the field for about two years before that sort of political moment. Uh, and the term unaccompanied child really came into the public sphere. And um, it's just sort of unraveled in front of me since then over the past 12 years. So we always want to try to humanize these topics, right? We, we hear terms illegal immigrant, unaccompanied minor, and that, that is a very broad term to describe the conditions that people are living in and going through. You've done so much research and met so many people. I'd love for you to share any of the stories that really stood out to you uh, about some of the individuals that you cover also in your research and in your books. Yeah, I will tell two stories. One is the one that I opened the book with, the story of Caleb. He was the first young person that agreed to take an interview with me after seven months of doing sort of community observations. Uh, Caleb is an indigenous Mayan Guatemalan young person. He left Guatemala at 14 uh, after a conversation with his parents where they told him something along the lines of, we don't see a future for you here. He wasn't going to school. There also weren't a lot of job opportunities. So the family started having conversations when Caleb was 14 about what his future would look like. Uh, and he arrived in Los Angeles within that year uh, looking for his uncle who was already living in Los Angeles. His uncle wasn't able to take him in. Um, and I, I sort of track over the, the course of the book, the coming of age and simultaneous immigrant settlement experience that Caleb endured, which started with, you know, the disorientation of, uh, of being in a new society as an immigrant, the disorientation of thinking his uncle would take him in, and then the unraveling of that relationship. And, and the way that Caleb, as a 14-year-old alone in Los Angeles, found uh, an apartment somewhere to live, found a job to pay his bills and support his left behind family, kept touch with his family over the next eight years um, at the time of, of the research, right? And um, came to be a young person transitioning from being a 14 year old to 23, 24 years old in his body, right? What was that experience of coming of age for him? And I track really this process of him forming community with other youth uh, in Pico Union, Los Angeles, finding mentors and establishing a, a sense of, of self and security in Los Angeles. Um, the other story I'll share is one of a sibling pair, Esmeralda and Patrick. I tell their stories in the book as well. And I think their case is really important to show how kids stay again like Caleb unaccompanied over the longer term, even as other family members are living in the U.S. So Esmeralda left Guatemala after her older brother and sister had already migrated before, and they weren't able to keep those promises to the family that they would support the family. Uh, so the next sibling migrated and the next sibling migrated. And I came to know Esmeralda two years after her migration to Los Angeles, Patrick migrated. Um, because Esmeralda wasn't able to keep the promise to support the family, including stopping child migration from their family. Um, Esmeralda thought her older sister would take her in, and that wasn't the case. Patrick thought Esmeralda would take him in, and that wasn't the case. So kids, even when they have families living in the U.S., and we see this over and over in the news, that um, they arrive thinking that there will be a, a household that will receive them and they end up unaccompanied over the longer term. And again, I track each of those two siblings, how they came to experience disorientation and eventual adaptation, forming community and relationships as they were growing up. And in even though they're siblings only two years apart in very separate worlds, 
right? Um, so, so kind of tracking also the, the relationship dynamics between sibling pairs. So let's talk about the difference in your in the research you've done, the folks you've talked to, and and your own experiences with the people in your community. Um, I I have to imagine the distinction between being a young man and being a young woman going through this process must be vastly different, uh, both right. from a uh, from a maturity standpoint on both sides, and also just all the challenges that a young man or young woman face in the world if they didn't have this hanging over their head. So can you walk us through a little bit of, let's start with the young men. Um, unfortunately, because there's such a stigma about this idea that if you're a young teenage boy, you must be up to no good. And that's unfortunately something in the United States for our listeners abroad. And this is not the only country where that is sometimes said about young migrant men. Uh, but it's an extra stigma on top of all of the other things. How much does that play into the psyche of these individuals? And how much does that create additional barriers for them as they're trying to, as you said, orient themselves in a new culture? Yeah, all of these stigmas, it's so interesting because at the time that I was doing this research um, in 2012, folks will remember that was the time where DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, was being introduced. So there was this image of what a productive or good immigrant teenager was at, at the time that I was entering the field. Come 2014, um, unaccompanied minors, unaccompanied children as vulnerable or as a threat to the, to the border and to the U.S. nation state was a new sort of discourse that they, the people that I was researching had to grapple with. Um, and then come 2016 and the introduction of a new election cycle, the framing of Central American youth, Central American men in particular as deviant, as criminal, as a threat to um, communities and the American in quotes body, like the physical body of Americans, right? Uh, so I was able to see through the course of my research, how young people made sense of what exactly what you're saying, the stigmatizing discourse of the US political nation state and also the, the sort of social worlds that young people were occupying. Men are positioned in that discourse as the threat, right? Um, and in a sort of cultural context, from a Latin American cultural context to the U.S., and we see it in the U.S. cultural context as well, men are framed as independent, emotionally void, as uh, maybe financially capable of sustaining themselves and their families. There's the expectation that the young men that would migrate to the U.S. would be providing remittances to support left-behind families. So the young men in this research really we're dealing with a lot of pressures, right? A lot of external pressures and expectations. And of course, they're also just teenagers that want partners and are attracted to people and, and feel like they have to physically look a certain way. So there's all kinds of external pressures on their shoulders. Uh, the men really talked about the struggle of taking care of themselves as independent teenagers transitioning into adulthood and their needs and the overwhelming emotions they were dealing with, that disorientation. But also, I remember young people saying things like, my hormones were changing. Things were just out of control. And there wasn't a parent or a sibling or someone to really tell them, well, this is why you feel anxiety, or this is why you feel sudden bouts of sadness, right? Or um, just overwhelming emotions. I remember I, I kept analyzing for this code, right? Like overwhelming emotions. Everyone was talking about emotions being haywire, men and women, but because men are expected to be independent and tough and not feel all of the things, um, there was no place for men to really put that, um, especially outside of, of protective households. Uh, the women, on the other hand, dealing with some of those same larger frames of like the, the immigrant threat, but because women are seen as docile, sensitive, maybe more dependent, and then more emotionally vulnerable, women were sort of protected in a lot of ways from the expectation that they would just toughen up and just go through it, right? And even in our conversations, there were a lot more tears in the interviews. There was a lot more expression of how difficult it was to be away from mom, dad, or siblings uh, in the U.S. context. Um, I have a lot more to say about gender dynamics, but I'll let you, I'll let you ask the question. <laughs> 
No, let's keep going. I, I think this is a very important topic because we, we lump unaccompanied minors together as if they are one monolith that are all yeah. experiencing the same thing. They're not. And there's a lot of different things happening. But I do think that gender dynamics are an important one because it feels like the conversation is always tinged with assumptions about what mm -hmm. either side of that is feeling. And you're talking about an age group where I don't care where you're from or where you grew up. Like your teenage years are tough years for anybody. They're tough. <laughs> <laughs> in the best circum, this is what I say. Like in the best circumstances, I was, you know, am U.S. born, English speaking. Both of my parents were around. They had citizenship status. My mom bought me my first car. Oh, and like, still it was hard, you know? Like I was in school, I went to UCLA and still it was hard. So I always think like when you layer all of the disadvantages and all of the forms of marginalization and the fact that young people are doing it alone, right? And oftentimes that their their networks are other unaccompanied teenagers. Um, it is both the the challenge in the longer term and the strength of the community in that, these young people grow up very innovative and very strategic in the things that they do and where they spend their time and resources. Um, but gender, yeah, I think is one of the gender and also ethno racial identity is one of two of the things that I bring up over and over in the book because men, as much as they are emotionally or, or interpersonally disadvantaged, they are better positioned in at work in that men are paid more than women are paid. Um, men are sort of at liberty to participate in public community life in ways that women are expected to be home and in private. So in terms of getting information about new jobs or cheaper rent or where to go for whatever resource they might need, um, women are disadvantaged a lot of the time, right? They don't have those networks. They can't be out past, you know, after dark. Um, they can't just make friends with just about anyone because of the the physical insecurity that they or lack of safety, I should say that that women um, uh, feel. And then also, um, they have less less options to cope. Women have less options to cope with the the sadness and the disorientation um, because they are really confined to households a lot, of, or or that the work that they do is. Um, as domestic workers or as nannies. So they're constantly just in private spaces in ways that men are not. So there are advantages and disadvantages in being on both sides. Um, and yeah, then you, you get into the in-between of, of youth sexuality and sexual orientation, and it gets a lot more complicated. So when we think about the decision to migrate, either as an individual, as part of a family decision, sort of an assumption that there's somebody waiting for you when you get there, is there a distinction between the way the young men and the young women think about this? Is it an easier decision for one or the other? Is it, are there pressures on one gender versus the other when they make that decision? Are, are there families who maybe push one or the other, like, yes, you can take that chance, but no, we don't, we don't want the other to take. Talk us through how a family or an individual makes that decision and whether there is a distinction between being, again, a young man or a young woman who has to go through this. Yeah. Um, in the decision to migrate, people didn't talk to me about the different strategies families took in sort of negotiating the migration decision. But I did notice in the research that uh, men and women were displaced for different reasons. Like the reasons they felt like they had to go were gendered. Um, women often had confrontations with, you know, I talked about Caleb earlier, Caleb not being able to see a future. His parents were talking to him about the lack of job opportunities or that he couldn't go to school. I have another case of a young woman um, whose pseudonym is escaping me. I can only remember her real name right now, so I won't say it. But um, she talked to me about how in her family, she realized that there was no opportunity to form new family, right? She was thinking again in, in terms of the private social context uh, she saw that her family couldn't afford groceries. She saw that her siblings were hungry. Her mom was always crying. So her reason for uh, not seeing a future was in the household context and in the sense of 
her not being able to see how family life would proceed if she didn't migrate. Um, and, and likewise, when I, when I talk to um, indigenous men, they would say things like they couldn't go to school in, you know, for an extended period of time, but indigenous women didn't go to school and to begin with, right? Like school was not something that they felt that they were excluded from because men are given the priority uh, in terms of the scarce resources that families are negotiating for youth's futures. Um, so when young people then thought about, cause I asked all of my interviewees, like, what did you think life in the US was going to be like? And then when they gave me the answer, well, what is it actually like? You know, um, so when I asked them what they thought it would be like, it was often the case that across the board, young men and women thought that they would have to work when they arrived in the U.S. They didn't actually expect someone to take them in and just receive them as children, because we're talking about a set of young people that were already working either at home or in the public labor market in their origin country. So they expected that they would be workers in the U.S. context. Um, young men who were res whose long settled relative, I call them in the book long settled relatives, but if a young man was received by a long settled relative that was also a man, there was an expectation that he would be materially and emotionally independent. You've got this, right? Like, it's a man talking to a man and the sort of messaging was men take care of themselves. Um, if a young man was being received by a long settled relative that was a woman, say a grandmother or a cousin that was a woman or an aunt, the woman would adopt that sort of nurturing woman role and do what she could to create any sort of system of support. But because women, again, are disadvantaged in the labor market, they didn't often have extra money lying around where they could support the kid fully um, and let him go to school. Um, so he would have to be a worker anyway. For women, uh, it's sort of similar but different in that when a young woman was received by a long settled relative that was a woman, they made efforts to receive this vulnerable, emotionally dependent woman, right? Sort of these ideologies of what men and women are capable of doing, positioned women, young uh, unaccompanied girls in a way where they had advantage initially, right? In that they were more well-received than young men. That was the case also when a young woman was being received by a long settled uh, relative that was a man. He would do his best to welcome and support that, that girl. If that man was married, suddenly there was a woman partner that didn't want a teenager in the house, right? So I noticed that young girls would be sexualized as they were growing up. Um, and that would sometimes lead to fragmented families. Girls would end up living with an uncle and his wife or uncle and his girlfriend for a couple of months. But the girlfriend or the wife didn't like the idea of a girl living in the house um, and a girl that they had just met. So families would fall out and that girl would end up unaccompanied again, right? Um, so so dynamics like that play out where you there's an assumption that immigrant families, that Latino immigrant families in the U.S. are just welcoming, right? This idea that family networks see kids and we just take them in and we support them. But the, the structural realities are that long settled families are often undocumented themselves, are living in poverty, relationships are fraught with gender dynamics or um, just relationship dynamics that you can't account for. So it isn't always the case that just because an aunt or uncle or cousin is living in the US, you're going to be received by them. Let's explore the the topic of un, the, the term unaccompanied. Because that's an easy term, I think, for people to wrap their mind around when you're talking about a 14-year-old or a 15-year-old. But somehow when somebody turns 18, turns 19, the age where if you're born in the United States or another westernized country, maybe you're going off to college at that point, you're going off to school, it's sort of uh, the coming of age is complete and you're off to right. explore the world. And yet if you are in this country and you're still struggling to establish yourself and you're not necessarily going to school, but you are working, 
you're still very much unaccompanied in that sense. So w- when you think about it and when you talk to the, the, the kids and the teens about this, at what point does that term like drop off? And, and we no longer think of them as unaccompanied youth. We now think of them as adults and we right. start to assume they don't need the support that we might have assigned to somebody who we put in the youth category. Yeah. The term unaccompanied in the U.S. context refers to kids who are apprehended at the border, they're under the age of 18, have no legal status, and no guardian when they're apprehended. So by those terms, technically, the young people that I spent six years with and researching are not actually unaccompanied children because they were not apprehended at the border. And they aren't federally designated. There's no paperwork that assigns them the term or the category unaccompanied child. But the lived reality is that they migrated without a parent or guardian, and they are growing up in the U.S. without a parent or guardian or anyone that is sort of giving care to them. They are their own caregivers, right? Uh, So I assign the term to this group of youth that I interviewed. sort of informally, because it is a reflection of their reality. Um, what the, What is sort of hard to grapple with, and even as a researcher who has spent now 13 years studying this stuff, is the sort of rigid categories around childhood and youth, as you're suggesting, and like a young adulthood, emerging adulthood is, you know, what psychologists uh, use and child development folks. Uh, and then adulthood, like when are you actually any of those things? I mean, I'm I'm in my 30s. I call my mom for everything. I'm a professor at Berkeley. I wrote a book and I still am like, mom, I got this letter in the mail. What does it mean? Like, I oftentimes don't feel like an adult myself, right? Um, None of us do. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm, I actually asked my research participants, of the 75 people that I interviewed, I asked them, um, Like, what does being adult mean to you? When did you reach adulthood? And that's really tricky when we're talking about kids who have been shining shoes and selling trinkets on the street since they were three years old, right? Kids who never completed school, Um, people who are at the age of 25 when I'm interviewing them in Los Angeles at a boba shop, still doing the exact same thing they were doing at seven, just in a different place and with a little more advanced machinery. So to them, even the, the, the lines of childhood, adulthood, it's all blurred. So I really explore in the book this idea of an emergent frame of reference. The idea that young people have really, uh, the young people that I was researching have really sort of blurry senses of what childhood, adulthood, um, legality, illegality, belonging, non-belonging, all of these sort of things that they're confronting with, they have blurry senses of what those things mean because they established an understanding of childhood in Guatemala or El Salvador or Honduras or Mexico. And to them, that was you know, the sort of family agreement that kids would finish three years of school and then start working. Um, I have quite a few interview participants that said, when you're over there, you think kids everywhere are living this life, that everyone is working when they're eight years old. You, you sort of imagine that everyone else is also just going to school for three years and then you know, it's over. So in the US context, when they're working at a factory or a restaurant kitchen, and everyone around them is an adult. And they're asking themselves, like, well, where are the kids? And the kids are all at school, because K through 12 is compulsory in the US. Then they go to church, and children are accompanied by their adult parents, um, or they're in community, and they see teenagers you know, just living a different life. There's a frame of reference of childhood that emerges in this in the U.S. context that is just not possible in their lived reality while they're still in the highlands of Guatemala. It's the same thing with illegality, right? Where young people are fully aware that they're migrating to the U.S. as undocumented immigrants. But the meaning of, the like the meaning of that as an embodied experience, as something that they're living in everyday life, 
it emerges through interactions that they have in the U.S. Like, what does it actually mean to be someone without legal status? What does it actually mean to be an indigenous young person um, outside of Guatemala or Honduras? Like, those things emerge in a U.S. context. So the same, you know, it, it's actually really heartbreaking to have conversations with unaccompanied young people who realize, I live as an unaccompanied person, but because I wasn't apprehended, I don't have that title and therefore I don't qualify for those services, right? Or um, I've been here as long as the DACA kids, but because I don't have the paperwork and I'm working instead of at school, I don't qualify for that category. There's all of these confrontations and um, it's just heartbreaking to see young people like have that frame of reference emerge in real time. Do you see that this group has a yearning to go back to their country of origin, to move on from the United States to some other country, to stay in the United States? What are their aspirations having gone through all of that they go through at that age? How does that shape the decisions and the goals that they have for themselves? Yeah, I, I track this in the book and... um have thought about it a lot. So because of the sort of blurriness of the transition to adulthood, because young people are still doing a lot of the things that they've been doing since they were eight years old, um, there is no clear moment of like, and now I'm an adult, right? Um, one of the things I talk about in my research is that most of my participants say very clearly, they imagined being in the US between two and five years. So they left home country as a 14 year old thinking they would return at 17 or eight, you know, still as a teenager. And I'm interviewing them in Los Angeles as a 26 year old, 27, you know, years have passed. And there was one person that very clearly told me, um, I named him Aaron in the book. He tells me like 10 years passed and I don't know what, I don't know where that time went. I don't know what I've been doing, but what they've been doing is working and working and working to survive, right? Survive in Los Angeles, which is the most, one of the most expensive cities, metropolitan areas in the US, but they're also concerned in their transition to adulthood in the US with making sure their families survive. So they're sending, they're working to send money and they're working to also keep themselves afloat here. So by the time um, young people do finally build that house that they promised or help their parents or siblings start that business they promised, it's been maybe a decade. And then at that point, I remember in the interviews having so many conversations with young people who were telling me, um, now I get to think about myself, right? But by then, again, they're in their late 20s, maybe mid to late 20s. And they said, like, I might start going to an English language class. I would love to get my GED, like a general education degree, um, which is a high school equivalent. Maybe I'll go to college. Someone said, maybe I'll go to UCLA. I might be 40 by the time I get there, but you know, there is a sort of aspiration that they will um, accomplish something that feels meaningful other than just surviving. Some people did say, I would like to return not to live there because ya me acostumbré, I'm already accustomed to life here, I'm already adapted. One person said, I've spent as much time here as I did in Honduras, right? Um, I think it was, he was 26, he left at 13. And he's like, I've been here the same amount of time I was there. Uh, and then other people said like, I would like to get legal status so I can maybe visit and come back. Um, but that, that sort of in between time was so prolonged that young people didn't feel like, like what would they go back to at that point, right? Um, and they did feel, I talk about this in the book as well, construction workers said like, I have helped build Los Angeles. Garment workers have said, like, I put clothes on people's backs in this city. Uh, I've been serving food all this time to, to workers. I'm part of this community as much as the next person is. So also feeling like there was some sort of claim or stake to belonging, maybe not in the U.S. broadly, but at least in Los Angeles, right? There's an important economic dynamic to this. So we've mentioned a few times um, that so much of the initial goal of coming to the U.S. or anybody who's migrating to a different 
country around the world is often doing so seeking work, and there's often employers who are looking for workers. Unfortunately, there's a fair amount of exploitation in that process, whether it's underpaying or improperly paying or not paying at all. Um, right. What were some of the experiences of the folks you interviewed as they got into the workforce in the United States? Oh, I could talk about this probably for months on end. It was <laughs> the, really the focus of a lot of the, the field work. So the observations that I did uh, whether it was at church or, you know, I went to a few English language, uh, adult English language classes, or the support group that I observed for the full six years that I was doing this research, the the experiences of workplace abuse, labor and wage exploitation, and also the physical and emotional manifestations of workplace violence were constantly being discussed. Um, young factory workers would talk about, you know, the migraines, the ear aches, the allergies, the sneezing, the spine pain, you know, uh, not being able to take breaks, doors being locked behind them to make it look like the warehouse was vacant, abandoned, but there are 30, 40 garment workers in the dark sewing clothes. Um, the sort of piece rate arrangement of garment manufacturing where people are paid per button, per sleeve, a few cents for every denim pant that is sewn. So the calculations that young people are making throughout the day where they think, if I want to make $100 by the end of this day, I need to sew 350 garments. Um, and they're doing that work, which is why they skip the breaks, right? They skip the, they, they don't use the restroom, um, things like that. Back, the car washers would talk about not being paid per hour or per car, but by tips. So if they didn't get a tip from the person that they were handing the keys off to, they weren't getting paid that day. And that's not something those of us who get our cars washed really know. Um, so maybe we think like, oh, they're getting paid already. Why am I going to tip them for doing their job? But that isn't how immigrant car washers are treated um, or weren't at the time that I was doing this this research. I had a case of a young person um, who was working in the downtown Los Angeles flower market, and he loved that job. He said he was getting paid a lot less than his previous job as a restaurant worker. He was a food preparer, so he would make all the sauces and put all of the uh, various condiments and, and different dressings on dishes as they went out. His employer asked him at one point, how much is your rent? And he was maybe 16 at the time and he told him he told the employer i name him gonzalo gonzalo told his employer um, i pay this much in rent so the man paid him that exact amount so that he gonzalo could pay his rent what ended up happening over the i think two years that gonzalo was working in, a, in that restaurant kitchen is he was owed nine thousand dollars of uh wages that that gonzalo calculated so uh, Gonzalo went to the labor commissioner's office in Los Angeles. He asked me to go with him. And can you tell me what they're saying if, if they only speak English? And he was able to recover $19,000 of stolen wages when the labor commissioner got involved and started to really try to understand the case. Um, all of that money went to Guatemala so that his younger brothers would not migrate as unaccompanied children after him. So even when Gonzalo had made this, you know, flood of money that could have really changed his life in LA. He, he was thinking, how do I make this work for my family and sent all of it there. So um, things like that come up all the time. And again, the like enduring uh, embodied effects of exploitation, the anxiety that young people feel, the fear, the, the, the headaches that they would talk to me about. Um, things like ulcers, right? chemical burns, all kinds of things that show up on their body, if not because of the work directly, like an injury that happens at work, um, the emotional, like the psychosomatic manifestations, right, of knowing that you are being exploited and abused, and that despite all of your effort all day long, you're not really getting ahead. You're just barely getting by. What are some of the other disadvantages that a young person coming to the country without that family support system that we might take for granted from somebody who maybe is an American born person. And for one reason or another, they're also out in the world on their own at that age. But, but what are some of those disadvantages that you have when you don't have documentation, let's say that, that 
you or I wouldn't have to deal with among all the other issues of a 16 year old living on their own. Yeah. Um, complete denial of access to the social safety net. So without what, what I saw is that without parents in the picture for these young, young people, or without a, an adult caregiver that's doing the labor on behalf of the child. So the child can be a child, which in the U S is go to school, get the, attendance diploma, you know, like whatever certificates, uh, accumulating paperwork um, that sort of gives even a child a track record, uh, a paper trail in the U.S. context. Because unaccompanied young people were not able to access that sort of care, they didn't have any sort of way to prove their presence when things like DACA or when other sorts of uh, eligibility requirements rolled around where they had to show that they were productive members of U.S. society in the way that we uh, ask people to prove that socioeconomically or um, achievement-wise, right? Um, and that without that, they wouldn't be able to access housing support, food, like access to a food bank, access even to um, health care uh, at the time of the research, which has changed in California where undocumented children can access um, some baseline health care, but that wasn't the case at the time of the research. Uh, things like that, where even if I were to were to have severed ties and left school with my family, if I had severed ties with my family, left school, if I had just been a homeless or runaway young person, there are federal and state services that are granted to me as a U.S. citizen, right? Or as someone who is recognized by the federal government and the state government and these young people were not at, um, able to access those things and because of the level of vulnerability where uh, people would ask me all the time like well why don't they just say hey i'm here i'm a kid and i need help well um they can't do that really because if they are sort of outing themselves as undocumented and unaccompanied youth workers they wouldn't be able to work so that they wouldn't be able to support their left behind family. So even if you take this young person out of the workplace and you give them a place to live, they're still thinking, well, I promised my mom I would send money for groceries or my grandma's really sick and I need to send money for her medicine. Uh, so some of my participants, when DACA rolled around um, and when un other unaccompanied children were being recognized at the border as unaccompanied, I remember being in several conversations where the study participants would talk about like, well, should we let people know that we need help too? And the decision was always no, because who's going to help my family? Uh, and that always weighed on them, which is, I think, another thing that kids, I didn't grow up thinking, I wonder if my mom's hungry, right? Like, or I wonder if my siblings um, need like softer socks. Like I just wasn't worried about that. That's what my parents were doing. Um, and these are teenagers who are very much in their own survival mode, but constantly thinking about budgets and feeding families. And are my siblings uh, able to stay in school? Or um, is my mom able to participate in, you know, her church or community cultural um, events that she wants to participate in. And we just don't grow up like that in the U.S. for the most part, right? When you think about the idea of assimilation, this is a topic talked about a lot, that at some point people start to feel like they are part of the fabric of a country. Now, I know your research is focused on the United States, but as a sociologist, you've obviously looked at this and thought about this from many different angles. Do you feel like it is easier or harder when you're trying to assimilate in a city like Los Angeles, which is big and diverse and there are some opportunities and in theory, there might be a community that you can connect with? Is, is that an easier environment to find some community or in some ways is a large city even more challenging because even people who live in those large cities sometimes have challenges finding their own community and, and they're native born. Does your research tell us anything about the difference between being an immigrant in a rural community, urban community, suburban community, w whether the difference between California and Texas and New York uh, either yeah. offers any advantages or disadvantages? Yeah. So I, I do grapple with this a bit in the book. Um, I mean, yes, Los Angeles is both 
a better and worse place to be an immigrant, especially an immigrant teenager. It's better in that there's a long history of migration. There is a dense network of immigrant organizations. There is um, an array of housing, like in terms of housing costs, there are, and for very awful reasons, there's cheap apartments that kids can rent because they are dilapidated and falling apart and all of that, right? Um, there's public transportation, there's other unaccompanied kids in uh, all kinds of things that make it um, navigatable, I guess, for teens. Uh, and those things are also the disadvantages, right? There's a long history of migration, which means there are um, sort of segregated immigrant enclaves. There is uh, public transportation that costs them money that they weren't anticipating they were going to spend. Uh, there is um, uh, Im Latino immigrant community that uh, disparages indigenous, you know, the anti-indigenous racism, anti-Black racism in the U.S. context that out is outworked in the Latino community in the U.S. as well. Um, so there's, there's, and while there are organizations that are helping immigrants uh, settle in the Los Angeles context, again, a, a lot of this stuff is, the support of children is really hinged on this idea that children have parents that are acting as those community liaisons. Kids often can't walk up to a counter at a community organization and say, I would like this service. It's, the question is always, where's your parent? Where's your guardian? Um, or where's your identification? Why aren't you at school? Uh, those sorts of questions that the, the people in my book really couldn't uh, bypass. Um, in terms of assimilation, the argument I make in the book is that we need to move past this idea that immigrants are assimilating, or I, you know, I grapple with the idea of incorporation, right? The incorporating into one American mainstream, as, you know, that there is um, sort of a national level incorporation. I make the argument in the book that people are incorporating into their distinct social context where they're arriving. And in that, I track a process of um, the movement from disorientation to orientation to adaptation, which is the positive experience of an immigrant sort of learning their very distinct social context, um, or the sort of underbelly is perdition, perdition, this feeling of loss, loss of self, loss of goals, loss of relationships, loss of the future. In which case I'm saying how it happens in Los Angeles, but you can take that model, I argue, you could take that model and put it in Kansas, you can put it in Illinois, you can put it in New York and see how people are experiencing the initial disorientation to that space, how they become oriented over the longer term. Do they or don't they become adapted? Do they experience perdition? Um, and it really is based on networks, right? Because the connections people have, what is, what is the economic structure and opportunities in that place? What are sort of the dangers that people are facing physically or emotionally in those places? Uh, so the mechanisms, I argue, are the same. And the process, I argue, is the same. But it really depends on what the features or characteristics of like the ground, what is happening on the ground that really makes the process work in one way or the other. I do, in the conclusion of the book, argue that it isn't just an immigrant process. Right, we are all undergoing constant disorientation, orientation, adaptation, or perdition, um, and trying to, as you said, to humanize the people that I work with by drawing the the sort of connection between, like, okay, I just started this job at Berkeley two months ago. I felt very disoriented. I still feel disoriented. Eventually, I'll become oriented and I'll adapt. Um, there may be days where I feel lost. There may be days where I feel disconnected. Um, I think everyone is engaged in this process, which I hope allows us to have empathy for the way unaccompanied young people live through that process.
Was there anything that surprised you as you were engaged in this research, maybe assumptions that you had going into it, or as you were writing the book, um, that having had all these conversations and thought about all these different situations, was there anything that really that either surprised you or that you don't hear talked about in the mainstream conversation around unaccompanied youth and immigration? Yeah, I think the whether it's an academic discourse or just what's the discourse that's in the general public, the idea that when there are not adults in the room, kids are just going to run amok, right? And their lives are just destined for um, just really bad outcomes, deviance, you know, disconnection from society, um, all kinds of things, especially as it relates to immigrant young people. What really surprised me was that in the absence of adults in the room, so to speak, young people really came to care about each other, right? They started to develop support groups and community garden meetups and running clubs. And they were doing the work of caring for one another, even as the system let them down, even as other people in their communities let them down, even as their parents who kids would call home and and ask for advice and parents had never migrated. So they didn't have much to share in terms of helping their kids move forward. Um, teenagers and young adults and as young people transitioned into adulthood would speak back to recently arrived kids that were teenagers moving into young adulthood and they became their own system of care. And that I think um, really kind of blew my mind as a sociologist that anticipated that when kids are not in parent led households or in K through 12 schools, they're just bound to what we call the underclass, right? Like just um, disconnection from society. Well, so I, I hadn't thought about it in this context, but you know, let's let's talk for just a second here about the difference between the experience of somebody who has grown up through the trauma in many cases of dislocation and disorientation, and then the relative calm of, as you described, sort of a traditional upbringing. You you hit all your milestones and so forth, and yet in the United States, and I think we're seeing this trend globally, we have nothing but endless stories of youth living with anxiety and stress and sadly suicide, depression and addiction. Right. Do you see the same trends in the immigrant communities that you research or do you see sort of a resiliency from that community that I don't want to say insulates them from those things, but it it creates its, a separate set of stressors that avoids maybe the the stresses of an easier upbringing. I'll, I'll put it that way. Yeah, I do see that. And that's the distinction I draw between a sort of adaptation or a perdition. The features of perdition that I observed were um, drug addiction among young men, young women really wanting to calm the pain of loneliness and, and indefinite separation from their families, poverty, um, whatever pain they were enduring through romantic relationships that could become abusive. Um, and being sort of isolated in a very abusive home. And then self-harm, suicidal ideation, and acts of suicide show up in the state of perdition. Uh, the difference I find between a young person who ends up adapted versus perdido or lost um, is meaningful social ties. So when young people are connected to peers, mentors, maybe neighborhood organizations where they are able to, um, I, I borrow a term that the, a lot of my participants use, desahogo, desahogar, which means to undrown, to unburden, or to vent very practically. Um, they, young people are able to adapt or adjust to their circumstances a little bit better. And I make the case over and over that isn't to say the circumstances are good. They're awful circumstances and we need to do everything we can to, to make it so that young people don't live these lives. But when they have meaningful relationships that um, make people feel seen and heard and safe emotionally, they're able to continue doing the, the, the enduring work um, to support themselves and their families. When young people 
are not developing meaningful social ties and feel socially and emotionally isolated, they engage in behaviors that end up putting them in worse positions, right? Like spending all their money on drugs and alcohol. So then they're more stressed and they're working harder and then they're spending more money on drugs and alcohol, that sort of thing. Um, so I really try to draw again, like the, the human aspect of like, if we want to intervene again, in any case where a young person is dealing with depression and anxiety and wanting to leave school, or I think a lot about the connections between unaccompanied kids and foster youth, right? There's a lot of literature in the foster youth um, research space that argues that young people need stable, meaningful social connections. There's a, sort of a new body of work on refugee children and the importance of them developing meaningful social connections. And I think um, in a world where we're sort of pitted against each other and told that resources are scarce and that we need to you know, individualize either ourselves or our family units to survive and build fences around our homes and put bars on our windows, like all of these things that keep us more and more isolated. The solution is not more money and more fortified walls. The solution is actually um, developing networks of care and developing meaningful social connections with one another. So we'll conclude with this question about who is in the best position to do this, because in the United States, while we look to government to solve certain challenges and put in place policies, and if there are any, feel free, we, we can talk about those. But others say, look, uh, nonprofits are in a better position to organize this and raise money. Churches are in a better position yeah. to organize this and tie a community together. From your research and from, from your view, is there any particular group? organization or combination of all the above that is well positioned to offer this kind of community? Yeah, I argue uh, community-based organizations, both in the U.S. and in the origin country context, because if our idea is that young people should not be migrating to begin with, either as a matter of border enforcement or just not wanting kids to endure the conditions that I outline in the book, um, really trusting community-based organizations that know what's happening on the ground in these distinct regions or neighborhoods where kids are growing up, they are the best position. But we're also 10 years post-humanitarian crisis of 2014, right? It's been 10 years. The young people that I interviewed for the book migrated in the decade prior, between 2003 and 2013. There are decades and decades of people who have grown up as unaccompanied kids who are the best position to tell us what unaccompanied children need. Um, and I think really putting our muscle and our money behind organizations that draw on lived experience and really value the voices of youth themselves to lead the agenda, rather than us continuing to say, what kids need is this. And we like keep imposing things on children and families in um, structurally disadvantaged positions. Like, I just don't think that that method is really working anymore. And we need to really ground ourselves in community and ground ourselves in youth voices, which I hope is what people take away from Sin Padres Ni Papeles, just listening to, to, to the lived reality from, from youth's perspective. You've been very generous with your time. Thank you for talking to us about this important topic. If people would like to purchase your book, do you have a preference for where they do so? Yeah, it's available on Bookshop, which also supports independent indie bookstores. It's also on Amazon. So wherever is easiest for the reader. I appreciate everyone's engagement with it, though. And thank you for inviting me. Of course, we'll put links to both on the description of this podcast and on our YouTube channel as well. Dr. Kenneth Ellis, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'd ask you for a moment to consider what life was like for you as you remember it. When you were a teenager, particularly an early teen, 14, 15 years old, if you live in the United States, there's a pretty good chance that you were in some form of high, of, of high school. Uh, if you live in any number of countries around the world with a similar uh, scholarship program or with a similar trajectory for education, you were in some form of education. You were still in school. If you didn't go to school, you may have been in your early years of working, probably odd jobs, probably not getting paid a lot, but just remember what the mindset was like. Remember how little you really understood about the world and yet how big the place seemed and how many possibilities there were and, and how healthy 
you felt and how carefree maybe you were, but also the decisions that you made at that time based on maybe not so great information and maybe not always the right sources of information in your life. Now imagine everything that you went through as a teenager, but you are in a completely unfamiliar surrounding with no reliable adults in your life. Now, this story is not exclusive to immigrants. There are many Americans, many Brits, many Australians, many Canadians, many people of all cultures around the world who are living without their biological parents, sometimes living with parents who are kids themselves because they had children at such a young age, and maybe they're living with extended family members who just simply are unable to truly provide them any real guidance because they're going through so many issues themselves. When I think about the challenges that we talked about today, I felt it was important to single out the what we call the unaccompanied immigrant community. But I don't necessarily think it's a great idea for us as a society to just isolate that youth from all of the other youth in our societies who are going through similar challenges, who feel isolated, who are isolated for any number of reasons from their families, whether they're adopted, biological, or extended. The immigrant community has challenges that are unique to it. But the fact that we isolate it as an immigrant community means in some ways we're setting up that community to be even harder to integrate to our society when they have natural bonds with other young people who are going through something similar. And when they'd have an, this entire community would have a natural reason to come together, making itself larger, making it easier for people of good faith and community groups and church communities and others who are trying to reach them to find them and to offer some form of community. I guess it's a complicated way of saying I don't think we should further isolate young people who are going through so many challenges by then breaking them down into U.S. citizens and non-U.S. citizens and people who come from one part of the country versus people who come from another, people who are in foster systems versus people whose parents are going through addiction and unable to support them versus people who had economic challenges versus others who, who came from different circumstances. The point is, what bonds all of these young people together is a sense of dislocation, a sense of disorientation, as Dr. Canizelis put it, a sense of not knowing where they belong. Because if people of good faith don't view young people going through these challenges in this way, I assure you there are people of bad faith who will and who do. This is where organized crime gets its next generation of recruits. This is why there are drug cartels and gun runners and others around the world who are always able, it seems, to find an endless supply of young, impressionable people to work for them, to give them some sense of belonging. In the United States, we have a serious challenge in, in many of our cities with organized criminal networks. We call them gangs generally. And so much of that, when you really dig into the science behind it and the sociology behind it, it's a sense of belonging. It's young people who didn't necessarily grow up dreaming of being a gangbanger. They had nowhere else to go. And the people of bad faith gave them somewhere to focus their energies because nobody else would. So as we wrap this episode, I hope you learned a lot. I, I know I learned a lot. I hope that you look with a different perspective on the challenges that so many people face in the U.S., both those who have come here as very young people and those who came maybe a little, a little later in their youth years, but who want to contribute and who see themselves as part of a growing society and see themselves as building towards a better future. But I also hope that you don't walk away from this episode only thinking about the immigrant community. I hope you walk away thinking about the youth community, the teen community, the young adult community, not just in the U.S., but around the world. I uh, asked the question of Dr. Conizelis, um, this topic that we've covered in this program before, a seeming youth crisis 
of people who otherwise seem like they had a perfectly fine upbringing but are racked with depression, anxiety, stress, and sadly turning to drugs, turning to addictions, turning to suicide, tragically in so many cases, turning to alcohol and other things to deal with those stresses of youth. And it seems that those stresses have only grown worse. And so I hope we address everything we talked about today for people of good faith with a mindset of how we support young people everywhere, regardless of their background and regardless how they got to their circumstance. Because our young generation is the foundation of the future of this world. We've had many programs on our demographic realities in the U.S. and and in Western Europe and across the world, and we know that there are some serious challenges in the future. Now, the last thing we need is to make those challenges worse by not cultivating and fostering the young people that we already have who are trying to find their way in this world and find, trying to find a way to contribute. My final thought on this is to simply say for those out there who are in policy making positions or who are in nonprofit positions or who are leading community groups or who are just interested in this topic, concerned citizens, I would ask you not only to consider reading Dr. Conazales' book to get the real human perspective, take all the political and ideological stuff out of it, just read the stories of the people, but I would also ask you to reach out to those in your community who maybe have experience with this topic. Uh, It's probably going to be through local non-governmental organizations. It might be through um, uh, a local youth group. It might be through your local church. But don't just read the book. Don't just listen to this podcast. The only way this is ever going to be real to you is to reach out and find individuals who have lived this experience or work with those who do. And once you make this issue human and you can put a name and a face and emotions to it, I think it will change all of our perspectives and it will get us away from pointing fingers and get us towards looking for solutions. I thank you so much for listening to this program. And if you'd like to hear more shows like this, the best way you can do so is by subscribing either to our podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms or on YouTube. And you can also visit my website, brianjmatos.com, any of my social media channels as well. You can go to my website to find archives of all of our previous episodes and our show notes that go along with them. And on my YouTube channel, we're putting exclusive clips of the show. So if you want to share this with someone, but they're not sure if they want to listen to the full hour, you can get those preview clips forwarded on to them, have them take a listen for themselves. Hopefully they'll subscribe to the channel, listen to the full episodes and pass along to their friends. And don't forget to comment if there's anything that you want to you want me to know about the content of these programs, you can either comment publicly on our YouTube channel or you can send me a note directly. You can send me a note at info, I-N-F-O, at brianjmatos.com. You can also direct message me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at brianjmatos, or any of my other social media channels, for that matter. For you Facebook users out there, yes, I do check my Facebook messages. Um, And look, my website is the home of this program. Uh, So www.brianjmatos.com is always going to be the place where you can find our latest episodes, subscribe to the program, get links to my YouTube channel, find exclusive show notes, uh, and you'll find some previews of upcoming episodes that we still have to come. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. And until then, I encourage you all to stay curious.